Three reasons why the 2024 version of the Texas football team could be even better than they were in 2023. You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little bit further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. And on today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, we are reacting to an article from Eric Nalin and Inside Texas. Part of that article, he talked about three reasons why he believes the 2024 Texas football team will be better than they were in 2023. My reaction to what he wrote in that article in the second segment, our beloved Texas baseball program has now dropped two games in a row. They are currently in the middle of a series with Kansas State on the road. They play tonight and in the series tomorrow against Kansas State, but they did drop the first game last night. We discussed that. And then in the last segment, our women's basketball team has the opportunity to play Gonzaga tonight for a berth in the Elite Eight, the five keys for Vic Schaefer squad to advance to the Elite Eight. All of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network your team every day. So yesterday was just an electric day of sports. I wish it would have been scheduled a little bit better or staggered a little bit better. So you had the opportunity to watch more of what you wanted to watch. But, uh, you know, a great day in March Madness. We saw, you know, Arizona go down. We saw North Carolina go down. We saw UConn dominate, you know, per usual. Right. And then we saw Illinois win a really good game against, you know, the Big 12 zone, Iowa State. And then in Major League Baseball, you know, a great first day. We had a couple um, rainouts on opening day, but, you know, two things that matter to me the most, right? We saw the Astros lose and blow a 4-0 lead at home, and we saw the Rangers, the defending world champions, walk it off, right? So uh, great day of sports yesterday, you know, and hopefully that continues uh, throughout the weekend, especially for our Texas women's basketball team and our Texas baseball team, which we'll talk about in the second and third segments. But the team that's not playing right now is the team we're going to talk about in the first segment, and that's the Texas Longhorns football team. And on my last episode, I reacted to an article from Inside Texas and Eric Nalin. You know, of course, shout out to them and all the good work they do. Um, talking about one player who was standing out at each position in spring practices. And when I was coming up with what I wanted to talk about on today's show, of course, you know, the Longhorn spring practice schedule this week is Monday, Wednesday and Friday because of Easter. And so I was like, OK, let me see what happened um, in the last practice on Wednesday because I didn't record on Thursday. And what he had wrote in the midst of his practice notes article was three reasons he was getting from sources on why the football team in 2024 should be even better than they were in 2023. And I thought this was a good angle to discuss on today's episode. The three reasons from, you know, inside sourcing on why they think this team will be better. So I'm going to read the three reasons and I'm going to react to the three reasons after. Right. And that's how the first segment is going to be structured. So the first reason that Eric Nalin got from these high level sources right within the building is experience. He said Quinn Ewers was the first mentioned in the offensive line, regardless of what shape it takes. Right. Regardless of who the five starters are. Defensive backs and edges were also mentioned. Yes, they lost some really good players to the NFL draft. But where it's hardest to make up for lost starts is at the cerebral positions, quarterback center, middle linebacker, and safety. Texas is either good at those positions or Anthony Hill is in place. <laughs> Hill may not have experience at Mike, but he's a natural linebacker with a full offseason to learn how to lead. So that's the first reason. The sources are saying this team is more experienced than last year's team, and that could lead them further, you know, in the playoffs, I guess, this year, or to lead them to a national championship. Number two is Quinn Ewers, right? This is a bit of a continuation of number one, but the words he knows how to run the show convey a lot more than experience. This is his team. He's a much more confident leader, and he's becoming an increasingly more consistent passer. He's already better than he was in January, just like the previous year. He's on an escalator. He has not leveled off, right? We love to hear that about our leader, uh, Quinn Ewers, our franchise quarterback at the 40 Acres. And then number three is depth. With a major assist from second and first year players, competition is pretty much across the board, right? And that's what he talked about. So the three reasons that inside sources, people in the building, right, believe that this Texas football team will be better in 2024 than in 2023 is because of the experience on this football team, the maturation and growth of Quinn Ewers, and the overall depth on this football team. And now I'll react to, you know, those three facets, right? So the first one, 
is experience, right? And I completely agree. Um, and it's you know kind of crazy to say, which they mentioned, that you can lose so many veteran players, so many players that were here from the Tom Herman era, right? Like that's how much veteran leadership we had on this football team last year. And obviously, when you have eleven players that are going to the NFL draft combine. That's 11 players that have spent three years in college somewhere, right? Not all of them at the university of Texas, but you had a ton of experience on this football team. And I think that we just had a lot of players that were waiting in the wings that are now really experienced on this football team, as well as going into the transfer portal to bring in some really good experience as well. So we've seen from day one with Steve Sarkeesian that he's always favored experience over young players. And I think going into 2024, we have a really good mix, right? Of, of, talented veterans who have seen it all and played at the highest level in college football. And then those young players who are waiting in the wings in, in a year or two, who will be the starters on this Texas football team. Right. So when you look at just the experience, right, like I said, this is a veteran football team and we're not relying on too many young players to make a difference this season. That doesn't mean that, you know, they won't get snaps or make huge plays for us. But there's no real true freshman that we're saying we need you to start from day one and we need you to carry us. Right. And we're in a good position. Remember, going into the 2023 season, we needed <laughs> right Kelvin Banks to start as a true freshman. Um, you know, going into the 2022 season, right? Like we had to make Quinn Ewers the starter, right? Even though he relatively had no experience in college football, Texas is not in that position anymore, right? When you got players like Arch Manning, you know, players like Arch Manning sitting on the bench for two years, right? Texas is in a way different position than they were uh, three years ago. But getting back to the experience, right? When you look at it, Texas will have a third-year starter at quarterback in Quinn Ewers. Your 1A and 1B running backs in Baxter and Blue are back from last year and carried the ball a lot, a lot last year. Plus, Trey Wisner and Savion Red also got carries last year. So your top four running backs in the rotation carried the ball for you last season. At receiver, Golden, Bond, and Bolden have a ton of experience with Cook and Moore, DeAndre – Moore and Jonte Cook having a year under their belt in this particular system. That's experience, even though they haven't shown a lot on the field yet. Kelvin Banks, Jake Majors, and Hayden Connor have played over 100 college football games combined on the offensive line. Devin Campbell is a second-year starter, and if Cam Williams is your starter at right tackle, all five projected starters are upperclassmen, right? A ton of experience on that offensive line. At edge, Trey Moore, Baron Sorrell, and Ethan Burke are all juniors or older, and Colton Vasek and Colin Simmons are younger, but talented enough to provide have value this year maybe in a rotational role we'll see if Colin Simmons can step up into a starting role but either way you have a ton of veteran leadership in that edge room I didn't even you know mention Justice Finkley who's a junior as well so you have a ton of experience and really good players in that room to where you don't have to rely on Colin Simmons day one even though he's the type of player that it wouldn't hurt <laughs> to rely on from day one defensive tackle uh alfred collins and Vernon broughton have been here since sark has been here uh linebacker david benda and uh mo blackwell are vets and anthony hill was a starter last season at corner you got jade baron gavin holmes jalen gilbo manny muhammad and terrence brooks who have all started at some point in their career and then at safety you have andrew makuba and michael taft they bring over six years of experience to the safety position and Derek williams got a ton of reps last season so it's a veteran football team with experience at every position and the good thing is like i said you don't have to rely on too many true freshmen or sophomores to have huge roles on this football team and that just shows how much talent we've added to the roster since steve sarkeesian arrived in 2021 the second reason they feel like Texas will be better is because of Quinn Ewers, right? The maturation and growth of Quinn Ewers. And we've seen Quinn Ewers take big steps, right, after each offseason. Um, and I think this will be his best year yet, right? And I think we'll really see that transition from really good college quarterback, which Quinn put on tape last year, to franchise-level NFL quarterback, right? I think this is the year where an NFL franchise will say, okay, I am comfortable with Quinn Ewers coming in and hopefully changing the fortune of our franchise. Or if he goes, like, late in the first round to a good team, continuing the fortune of our franchise but i expect when you were to have the type of year that he won't last past the third pick in the nfl draft right everything we've heard about quinn since the offseason started has been phenomenal right we've heard about his increased command of the locker room and leadership especially losing so many veteran players to the draft it's important for quinn you were to step up and be that leader on the football team i think the quarterback on every football team has to be a leader in some form or fashion, at least lead by example. <laughs> you know, we've heard about him being in even better shape than he was previously, right? Up 10 pounds, but he looks more lean, you know, and definitely has added muscle to his frame. Um, and we've heard about him being more consistent on the field, especially with his accuracy in the intermediate and deep areas of the field. And I think there's just so much in front of Quinn Ewers this year. He has an opportunity to accomplish so much, right? And it looks like he's taking that challenge head on and he's embracing it, right? When you look at it, Quinn Ewers has the opportunity to win the SEC, 
for the first time for the Texas Longhorns, to win a championship for the first time since 2005 for Texas, to win a Heisman, and to be the first overall pick in the NFL draft, right? He can accomplish all four of those things with a really strong season, and it looks like, once again, he's accepting that challenge head on. Everybody is saying this is the best version of Quinn Ewers that we've seen, and like I said, I think he makes that transition this year from really good college quarterback, which he already was, you know, to franchise-level NFL quarterback and a type and the type of guy, the type of player that an NFL franchise can look at and say, I want him to lead my franchise for the next 10 to 15 years. And then they talked about depth, right? Just having those really talented first and second year players on this football team that aren't ready to play yet because you have veteran leaders and better players in front of them, right? And Texas has now gotten to that Alabama, that Georgia point, USC back in the day where you have four and five stars just sitting on the bench, right? This is not an exhaustive list, but when you hear these type of names, and these are players that more than likely won't be starting on day one, it just shows you the crazy amount of talent on this roster and how much depth you have at the second and third spots at each position. Arch Manning, Colin Simmons, at least one of DeAndre Moore and Silas Bolden, Jaden Blue. I know he's going to get a bunch of touches, but he's not your starter, right? Cedric Black, Cedric Baxter is. On pretty much every other team in the country, Jaden Blue would be the starter, right? regardless of what type of running style he has. Ryan Wingo, five-star. Brandon Baker, five-star. Cole Hudson, three years of experience that can play three different positions on the offensive line. Sadir Mitchell might be the biggest defensive tackle in the country. <laughs> He's not going to start this year. Kobe Black, a borderline four-star, five-star, true freshman at corner. And then Michael Taft or Derek Williams. One of them is not going to start at the safety position, but those are two really good safeties for the Texas Longhorns. So depth, experience, and a much improved Quinn Ewers are three reasons why most people around this football team think they'll be even better in 2024 than they were in 2023. And it's hard to say that with all of the talented players you lost to the NFL draft and what you were able to accomplish in 2023. But with that being said, even though it's hard to say, I tend to agree that this football team has the opportunity to be even better in 2024 in a harder conference than they were during the 2023 season. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Manscaped, right? This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below the waist grooming. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped's Lawn Mower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code Locked On for 20% off plus free shipping right their fifth generation trimmer the lawnmower 5.0 ultra features two interchangeable next gen skin safe blade heads a standard one for taking a little off the top and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires it also features dual led spotlights to guide you through the darkest winter debris navigate with confidence in your delicate areas hate making a mess not to worry this bad boy is waterproof shave in the shower in the bath or in the ocean. Get 20% off and a free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. <laughs> this episode is also brought to you by Better Together, right? Better Together is the first cooperative daily fantasy application. Better Together provides a sense of camaraderie and enhances the social experience of watching sports. Makes you realize that daily fantasy sports is fun alone, but like a lot of other things, it's better with friends. It's a way to stay connected with friends when you can't watch sports together in person and to put your group chat to the test unless you prove that yours is the best. Download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code Locked On for a free $5 entry into any NCAA basketball contest. Play with me in a contest on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, any day that ends in Y. <laughs> I remember the code locked on because winning alone is fun, but it's always better to get. I can't lie. I was like low key uncomfortable reading that manscaped read <laughs> and talking about y'all, you know, grooming the debris, <laughs> you know, down there, but, uh, Money calls, man. You know, money calls for sure. But that definitely was a roller coaster reading that ad read. All right, talking about the Texas baseball team and speaking of roller coasters, you know, my first job ever was at Six Flags Over Texas um, in Arlington. Just fun fact, you know. And uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> so I know what a roller coaster looks like <laughs> up close and personal, right? I used to, to, to be around them every day. And uh, yeah, this Texas baseball season has been a hell of a roller coaster for sure. Um, they've now lost two in a row in three of their last five games, giving them a record of 15 and 11 on the season. And when we talk about the Texas baseball program being the premier program in college athletics and being a national championship contender every year or that should be the goal to be five, uh, 15 and 11 at this point in the season especially last year at this time you were in the midst of a 16 game win streak so uh compared to what we're seeing this year for the texas baseball team it's not been good right and last night was a continuation of that not been good longhorn still have two games at kansas state today and tomorrow and they'll look to still win the series or at least avoid getting swept by the kansas state wildcats on the road i talked after last game right after they dropped uh, the last game, the Texas A&M Corpus Christi in a midweek game on Tuesday about how this team is inconsistent in every facet. And you can't really hang your hat on anything being consistent with this team. When you show up to the ballpark, right, what can you say with this baseball team, right? Like I'm a Rangers fan. I could say, okay, you know, pitching might be off, right? <laughs> like, you know, the pitching might be off tonight. Right? I don't know what type of pitching we're going to get. Defense, yeah, I don't know, usually pretty solid. But I know we're going to hit, right? Or I know we at least had the capability to hit. With this Texas baseball team, at least through 26 games, there has not been one facet of baseball we've been able to hang our hat on for this baseball team, right? After five straight games of allowing four runs or less, so the pitching had been on an uptick, they allow 14 runs last night. Your ace, you know, was a big part of that, allowing eight runs in just the second inning, right, and 10 base runners. Talked about how the defense has been inconsistent. So the Longhorns now have 27 errors on the season, which is a lot, <laughs> and a fielding percentage under 97 and a half percent. And I know if you don't watch baseball, you're not really in tune with it, and I'm, you know, that's fine, right? Not everybody does. 97 and a half percent seems really good, right? Or it sounds really good. Like why is John on Locked On Longhorns complaining about the Longhorns having a 97 and a half or lower fielding percentage? Because it's actually lower than that. Well, as I said on last episode, that's 92nd in the country, right? It shows you how good these baseball players are, right? That 97.5% fielding percentage, right, is not the standard. And like I said, that's 90th in the country for the Texas Longhorns. That is not good enough to be a championship-level team missing out on 2.5% or more of fielding opportunities. They need to be better defensively. They've been very inconsistent in that facet. And then offensively, in their last three losses, they've scored 10 runs total. But in their last two wins, they've scored 21 runs total. So it's like they're either out there scoring 10, 11 runs or they can't score at all. Pitching, defense and hitting has all been inconsistent for the Texas Longhorns. And that's why we're 15 and 11 after 26 games, because we don't have one facet of the game that we can hang our hat on. And at various points in the season, all three facets have looked really, really bad for the Texas Longhorns baseball team. When you look at last night, Texas jumped out to an early 3-0 lead with two homers from Jalen Flores and D. Kennedy, the first homer of his career for D. Kennedy. But then Kansas State <laughs> would, uh, I don't even know what I want to say. But Kansas State would score eight runs in the second inning, chasing LBJ out of the game. In that second inning, they had five hits and five walks, right? Texas has had a game where they didn't have, Texas has had games this year where they didn't have 10 base runners, period, right? Let alone in one inning. That's ridiculous. Uh, the Wildcats will score two more runs between the third and the fifth inning to increase the lead to 10 to three. One of those being on a solo home run. Then Kansas State hit two more home runs to make the score 13 to three in the sixth and scored their 14th and final run in the seventh inning. Now, Texas was able to get three runs back in the ninth. I've noticed that this Texas baseball team loves scoring runs in the ninth inning, right? Texas was able to get three runs back in the ninth on a home run and RBI double but, of course, could not score 11 runs in the ninth inning to tie the game. They went into the inning losing 14-3. to They made it 14-6, to but that's where their efforts stopped. And so, once again, they lost the first game to Kansas State. They have now lost two games in a row to Kansas State and Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And now their two options are to win the next two games and win the series or hopefully avoid getting swept. But I guess they have three options because they could get swept this weekend in Kansas or at Kansas State in Manhattan, Kansas. So, Two disappointing games in a row for the Texas baseball team, but luckily there's still a lot of baseball to be played. And luckily the two games that they've lost in a row doesn't have to define who they are for the rest of the season. But as we've seen through 26 games, like I said, every facet of this baseball team has been inconsistent and hopefully they can find some consistency by the time they play tonight and that'll carry them through the rest of the season. But that's definitely wishful thinking on my part after 26 games of data and what we've seen. <laughs> All 
All right, today's episode of Locked On Longhorns is brought to you by Nissan. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. So this is about UConn. It says the UConn Huskies can only be described as an armada. This one seed is as hardcore as it gets out there. So it's no wonder why they secured a spot in the Elite Eight and will battle Illinois in the Elite Eight for a chance to play in the Final Four. They're a favorite picked by many to make a run for a championship. When you think about how crazy it is what UConn has been able to do just over the last two years. So they had to win six games in last year's tournament to win it. And then they had to win to get to the Elite Eight, their first three games, right? 64, 32, and then 16, right? So they've won nine straight games in the NCAA tournament over the last two years. They have won all nine of those games by double digits, right? All nine of them have been won by double digits over the last two years by UConn in the NCAA tournament. We have never seen this level of dominance and I completely, you know, I can see why everybody and their mama thinks that UConn will just run to the national championship again. I had picked North Carolina to win it. They lost last night. And yeah, now, you know, when they've won nine straight games in the tournament with two different rosters by double digits, that tells me UConn is just doing things differently than everybody else in the country. And yeah, I don't think there's anybody that can stop them from getting three more wins and winning their second straight national championship. Taking the Nissan Road, Nissan Pathfinder or Nissan Armada. Go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Also, I just want to say for all the like Texas basketball fans, I know there was like a lot more last year than this year, right? But for all the Texas basketball fans that said we would have beat UConn last year if we had Dylan DeSue, right, like I think we could put that to rest. Uh, I hope nobody's still saying that, you know, but if they are, like, we should probably put that to rest. But speaking of the Texas basketball team, the women, Right. They are um, competing for the chance to get to the Elite Eight tonight against Gonzaga. Um, what's interesting to me is Texas is a one seed and typically one seeds get rewarded. Right. For being a one seed and, um, you know, accomplishing that over the course of the season. And I guess they did get rewarded with their first two games in the Moody Center. That was a crazy environment. But and this just could be how things were scheduled. You know, obviously, I'm not sure if the you know women's basketball committee or the powers that be expected Gonzaga uh, to be in the Sweet 16, and I know they beat a Utah team that was a higher seed, um, but, you know, admittedly, <laughs> I'm not going to sit out here and lie to you. I haven't watched Gonzaga too much at all this year, and I haven't watched Utah at all, so I don't really know who was the better team, to be honest. But I do think it's crazy that Texas has to play Gonzaga in the Sweet 16 five hours away from Gonzaga's campus. Like, if you really love Gonzaga basketball, that's an easy drive. That's one tank of gas in most cars, right? So, you know, there could be a situation where I know we like to brag about the Texas brand, but fans don't travel for basketball. So there could be a situation where this is a glorified home game tonight for the Gonzaga, right? I don't know if the, the ladies are called Bulldogs, maybe Lady Bulldogs, I'm not sure. But this could be a glorified home game from for Gonzaga because, like I said, this game will be five-ish hours from their campus it's a lot further away <laughs> from Austin, all right? But what are the five keys for Texas to, to beat Gonzaga and get to the Elite Eight as they should as a one seed? In two games in the tournament, Gonzaga has shot 43 three-pointers, right? They've attempted 43 three-pointers, and they've made 19 of them at a 44% clip. That's really, really good, right? Texas has only shot 15 compared to 43 and made six of them at 40%. That's still really good, but it's on really low volume, right? So Texas, or excuse me, Gonzaga has made more threes in the first two rounds of the tournament than Texas has even attempted. Right. And we've seen in this new era of basketball, no lead is safe. And we're seeing a lot more upsets because of the volatility of the three point shot. And these stats show you that this could be a game where that happens. This could be a game where Texas only shoots six to seven threes and Gazaga shoots 25 of them. And if Gazaga continues to be hot, they shot over 50 percent for three in their last game. So if Texas only makes two or three threes and Gazaga makes 14 to 15, right, which actually could happen, right, because I think they made 13 of them last game. That could be the variance that puts Gonzaga over the hump or provides them the upset over the University of Texas. In these games nowadays, you have to match your opponent from the three point line, right? Like you can't just get outshot from the three point line by 10 plus threes because that extra point adds up. You know what I mean? So, um, like I said, Gonzaga has made more threes in the first two rounds than Texas has even attempted, and they're shooting them at 44% as a team, right? So they are 
going crazy from the three point line. And I think for Texas to win tonight, you have to defend the three, but also make threes yourself. Right. You cannot allow them to just completely outclass you from the three point line. And then, of course, you have to, you know, utilize that pressure defense and, you know, prevent them from even getting a lot of these threes off. Right. Because that's probably going to be the key. It's not about them you know, hoping that they shoot worse from the three. It's about making sure they don't even get them off right by getting in their face. But like I said, Gonzaga has been blistering hot from three in this tournament, especially in their last game. And that could be what puts them over the hump against Texas if Texas doesn't defend the three-point line very well. Yvonne Ajin is averaging 19 points and 13 rebounds over the last four games for the Gonzaga lady bulldogs i'll say and so you know texas needs to win the paint battle with amo and taylor jones even you know gaston coming off the bench um because like i said yvonne Ejim has been a beast in her last four games if women want to be called beast you know i'm not sure i'm still getting into it still trying to figure out you know how we're going to angle it and how we're going to talk about it madison booker only has four three free throw attempts in her last three games right and when you're looking at her game log especially in conference play she was going to the free throw line six times a game eight times a game seven times a game making all of them but in the big 12 championship and then the two games in the ncaa tournament she only has four free throw attempts in her last three games she's really modeled her game after kevin durant right this is a bunch of jump shots but i do think in the NCAA tournament where these games are tight, where these games are in the margins, you need to get to the free throw line, stop the clock, right? Give the team a rest, get easy buckets for yourself, easy points for Texas, but also put, you know, that front line and those players for Gonzaga in foul trouble, right? And, you know, make their coach make tough decisions in terms of their rotation. So Madison Booker did a really good job, especially when Roy Harmon went out and getting to the free throw line and getting easy baskets that way. It has not been the case in the last three games as the stakes have gone higher. But I think if you want to beat a team like Gonzaga, a really good Gonzaga basketball team, Madison Booker is not going to only have to make those mid-range shots, but she's going to have to do a really good job of getting to the foul line, getting some easy opportunities, and then putting the Gonzaga women in foul trouble. You have to be more efficient in the paint. Texas shot 40% from the field overall, and about half of their attempts came from the paint or restricted areas. So Taylor Jones, Amo, Gaston, if our guards are driving to the lane, uh, whether that be Shea Holly, Shaylee Gonzalez, or Madison Booker getting into the paint, they have to be efficient at the rim and have to be efficient overall. I told you that uh, Gonzaga is shooting 44% just from the three-point line. Right, So if you're not going to win this game shooting 40% around the rim, we need to be better in that area that's plagued us all year it cannot plague us tonight if texas wants to get to the elite eight and the last thing is pressure defense for 40 minutes right we know vic schaefer ride the bull right ride the bull with that defense we've seen times where madison booker and other players were gassed trying to defend at that level and score particularly in the alabama game i mean there was times where madison booker was just huffing and puffing right just walking across the court because she's being asked to do so much score 21 points in that game and defend at a high level for 40 minutes i think that you know, in this type of game, being fresh is more important than being talented, even though you only have 40 minutes to work with. If Vic Schaefer is going to ask his players to defend at the highest level for 40 minutes, then they're probably not going to be able to play 40 minutes right? <laughs> because they're going to have to defend that hard and also come down the court and score as well. So I think you need to make sure that you have fresh players on the court at all times that can apply that pressure defense, especially with the way this team can get off threes and make threes at a 45 percent clip over two games in the tournament. And even if that that means you have to sit a Madison Booker for two, three minutes, or you have to sit a AMO for two, three minutes. You need these players being fresh and being able to employ that pressure defense. Because once again, if they're just out there huffing and puffing or letting people run right past them, that could be the reason you lose, right? I know you want your best players on the court at all times, but sometimes being fresh and being able to stay in front of your defender is better than being the best player on the court and huffing and puffing, <laughs> you know, running up and down. 94 feet. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, or team every day.